Hello and welcome to the 10th lecture which uh, I, Elmer Musayev, am teaching uh, at Baku State University for the postgraduate course uh, which is entitled Fight Against Corruption and the topic of our today's lecture is criminalization of money laundering. So before long, let us start with uh, the subject but before that, I would like to repeat our traditional slogans uh, for this lecture taking place in spring 2020. Stay at home, be optimistic and of course value your time. As you notice this time it's uh, more positive, even more positive than in previous lectures. So please value your time. Time is precious. Speaking about the content of the lecture, uh, this time it will be about uh, the usual item of general context. So I will try to identify the topic among the against the background, wider background. Uh, I will speak about the term of uh, money laundering explain you the uh, scheme uh, which this offense is taking in practice. Uh, we'll talk about the rationale um, uh, for the fight uh, against uh, money laundering, rationale for this taking anti-money laundering measures. Uh, we will speak about just um, mention the international instruments which are important in this field. Also, uh, very briefly, I will tell you about the international uh, infrastructure, how this issue is handled at the international institutional level. Then we will look into specific offenses and this uh, specific offenses as reflected in the legislation of Azerbaijan. Uh, and as I mentioned to you in our previous legislation and lectures, this topic, uh, as uh, other corruption offenses, it not it was not a product of uh, evolution of national legislation. Rather, rather it was um, the process of implementation of international instruments. Of course, some elements of corruption offences and anti-money laundering existed in national legislation, but overall the, the uh, general framework and um, the concept as it is right now, it came from the international instruments um, and it was uh, the will or the will of the country to, uh, to accept these uh, requirements but it doesn't change the essence. Uh, these provisions were introduced from international instruments. So the provisions of national legislation, um, they are mostly repeating the provisions of international instruments. Uh, finally, uh, I will speak to you about some forms and uh, peculiarities of uh, money laundering offenses. As you will know at the end of uh, this lecture, there are a few types of these offenses. So, um, general context. I told you in our previous lectures as well, it's worth repeating that Azerbaijan took on the model of uh, fight against corruption described and laid out in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption the first international instrument uh, in the field of um, fight against corruption at global scale and according to this uh, model um, described in United Nations Convention Against Corruption there are several uh, big topics, big areas uh, which are prevention of corruption, uh, criminalization uh, legal cooperation and asset recovery. Today uh, we are in the process of developing uh, 
and expanding uh, the second of this uh, item of this list, criminalization, after speaking about different types of corruption, including active and passive bribery, trade in influence, abuse of office, and uh, embezzlement, and various other types of uh, criminal offenses described in the convention. Um, this, the turn of uh, money laundering came finally. Uh, let me tell you that uh, money laundering is a huge, huge topic uh, in its own right. So uh, it is meriting um, maybe not one but several disciplines to study it. Our today's purpose is not to go into depth and study all aspects of money laundering. I will try to scoop it a little bit, uh, specifically in the context again of uh, fight against corruption. But even in the context of fight against corruption, uh, money laundering is quite a big topic. So big uh, that it's actually expanding beyond uh, these uh, four headings. So it's not located only in one heading, which we're dealing now, but it's actually expanding into the second heading as well, as you can see. Uh, so it's actually... So, uh, what is money laundering? What is money laundering? Just in case if we don't know exactly what it is, uh, I will guide you uh, carefully into the understanding of this term. So, uh, let us first look at the origin of the term, uh, how exactly this term appeared as you will later know, the exact name of the offence is the legalization of uh, illegally obtained property. Uh, but all the while, while we are calling today, it's mostly as money laundering. For the, for the sake of brevity and uh, for the sake of understanding. Um, so the term actually gets its origin in the beginning of 20s of the previous century with the uh, advent of the notorious uh, criminal head of uh, mafia um, in Chicago uh, at that time, uh, legendary Al Capone. Al Capone was uh, deriving his uh, assets and wealth in an illegal way and he wasn't very even um, he wasn't even trying to hide his uh, criminal status uh, amazingly to me when I was looking up this history of this criminal he was just uh, 26 years old when he became the top level uh, uh, mafia boss of his time and he was uh, bigger, apparently bigger than everyone. He was deriving his uh, wealth and his assets uh, through his wide network, his big empire of uh, illegal enterprises which covered brothels, uh, bootlegging uh, outlets and 
uh, through the racketeering as you see from this uh, picture of a guy with a Tommy gun so he was earning um, uh, a lot of dirty money dirty money illegal money he was obtaining this property and uh, I'm a bit maybe exaggerating but not so much it's covered in blood we know that dirty money is um, indeed uh, uh, illegal and it, it, it is taking its origin from uh, illegal actions well according to some bold estimations um, Al Capone was uh, he, he earned uh, during the seven years of his reign uh, up to hundred million dollars uh, uh, at that time at his own time which um, uh, the equivalent of which nowadays is around 1.4 billion dollars imagine uh, this one person was uh, earning uh, so much money at that time and uh, the thing was um, Al Capone was uh, not only uh, earning this uh, big amount of money but he was very successful in hiding this illegal uh, property he was investing in different uh, different companies different businesses and it was impossible at the time for the investigators or prosecutors to prove his title and to prove his ownership uh, to these various uh, businesses where he was putting his money and uh, interestingly uh, Al Capone actually um, owned a network uh, uh, through in many parts of the country of uh, laundromats laundromats for cleaning of clothes yes ordinary cleaning of clothes and um, he owned these uh, businesses, uh, not he, but businesses was owned and the money was actually flowing. Uh, the money which was shown as uh, income of these um, uh, legally established and legal businesses of uh, uh, laundromat, of uh, laundering. And eventually this business uh, was producing cash and through this scheme, uh, through this scheme, uh, Al Capone was earning his uh, legal money, his legal money. So the scheme was operating, the money was coming, and uh, he was perceiving himself as uh, a very rich person and unattainable for for law enforcement agency above the law. Uh, but just after seven years of his reign eventually uh, Al Capone was prosecuted uh, and uh, convicted convicted so he doesn't look so cool in this picture uh, in this cartoon with this mugshot and guess what he was uh, prosecuted and convicted for tax evasion at the time of uh, the um, anti-money laundering legislation didn't exist so he was prosecuted for tax evasion uh, um, let us look uh, what is it about I will try to explain to you what the money laundering is usually according to the established opinion uh, money laundering it, it consists of three elements uh, three elements and these elements are first uh, placement uh, layering and integration um, for those people uh, who don't understand these specific terms I will explain to you in a more um, graphic way just to facilitate your understanding so first stage is placement placement of illegal funds uh, we have this um, we already know this image of uh, illegal proceeds placement is this illegal proceeds illegal money and although I have here the picture of money uh, in fact it could be everything it can be uh, any type of property uh, including real estate or anything so as a result 
let's say, of bribery by a public official, uh, the subject uh, of the bribery could be real estate, um, which can be uh, transferred uh, to his ownership by a person who is bribing him. So introduction of this illegal property, legal uh, proceeds into legal economy. Just the first step uh, which is taken in order to place this illegal proceeds in legal economy. And this could be actually anything, anything, any financial transaction, any transaction with the property, any operation with this, uh, with the money. Uh, for example, it could be a purchase of or, or investment in a factory or money simply could be deposited with the bank. It could be uh, put on, a, on an account or a, something could be bought for it in a shop or indeed shop could be bought itself. So uh, this is uh, the first stage of money laundering, which is entitled placement specifically placement of illegal uh, property, of illegal funds or any property, into legal economy. The second stage, uh, as you uh, remember probably from the previous slide, is called layering. And layering is uh, our notorious illegal proceeds here in our, in our screen. Uh, is introduced into the uh, legal economy. Uh, the, this was the picture which you can see is a repetition of uh, the placement. Uh, layering actually is about further distancing of uh, this illegal proceeds from its original sources. So as we can see it can be a uh, don't take my uh, these pictures as a pattern. It could be, it could take different forms and different patterns. So it could be turned further into real estate. Um, after, uh, for example, a selling of a factory, it could be turned or or restructuring factory and turning it into the uh, into the uh, demolishing and building luxury apartments or investment in stock market or indeed uh, turning it into bitcoins right into um, um, electronic currency so uh, the more the more operations are taken uh, the more sophisticated it gets uh, the second stage of uh, money laundering which is called layering so it's actually already within the uh, legal economy. The money, uh, the property is making its further move to further distance from the illegal origin. But that doesn't change the essence, of course. That doesn't change the nature. Uh, illegal money remains illegal no matter what. Uh, and it's a task of uh, the law enforcement and judiciary to make sure that it cannot be hidden through different types of vehicles, whether financial or uh, business vehicles. So as we can see the third stage, the pictures from the previous file of a slide related to um, uh, layering, money further uh, makes another move, another step is taken and finally it takes the form of uh, what appears to be a legal property, right? Uh, so if taken at this stage, at this final stage, there's nothing wrong, uh, nothing wrong appears with the money. It appears as a normal money originating from a, a ordinary bank or any other source or any sold a property or taken as a benefit, as an income from the investment in stock market or cashed uh, from the electronic currency. So here it appears as nothing wrong with it, but in fact this uh, money remains illegal. So that in these three stages I try to explain to you uh, the scheme beyond uh, uh, money laundering. Um, what is the rationale? What is the rationale um, 
beyond uh, fighting this money laundering, beyond taking anti-money laundering measures. Um, the rationale beyond it is, first of all, as you can see, uh, depriving of benefits, depriving of criminal of the benefits of a crime after commission of any corruption offence, uh, criminals, corrupted public officials, typical uh, perpetrators in corruption offences, they are gaining uh, illegal uh, benefits. And um, the purpose uh, is to de deprive, uh, to deprive the, the corrupted public official of the subject matter of a rationale beyond corruption offence. And that's a good uh, measure to stop corruption offences. The second one is through the punishment, through actual tracing, uh, identification and uh, seizure of this property, of this money laundering offence uh, of the property, of money, uh, the uh, authorities, the state authorities, they are demotivating um, uh, corrupted people from committing this offence. So if uh, the cases are investigated and prosecuted, and people are con getting conviction for their uh, for money laundering offences. They will think uh, twice before committing any sort of uh, these actions. Next one is protecting the integrity of financial institutions. The problem is uh, that uh, despite many uh, safeguards which exist nowadays in financial institutions such as banks or non-bank financial uh, institutions in the area of recruiting um, uh, scrupulous and uh, law-abiding personnel. There could be some uh, people who are prone to committing offence and engaging in this type of uh, offences. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they might not be sufficiently informed and they may be weak uh, they may be weak uh, and uh, prone to the money laundering offences. So prosecuting, investigating and prosecuting this type of offence, it certainly uh, adds to the protection of integrity of financial institutions. But as we will know from our subsequent lectures, uh, this item is uh, more dealt with and is more appropriate under the other heading under the heading of prevention of money laundering, but let's leave it for our uh, subsequent uh, meetings and our subsequent lectures. Uh, the next rationale beyond anti-money laundering measures, it's uh, emanating from the previous item and it's about securing smooth operation of international financial system. You know, uh, most probably that nowadays banks and financial institutions of uh, countries around the world, they are strongly uh, interrelated, they have strong ties, they cooperate with each other on a very intensive basis. So it's actually these uh, financial um, institutions are operating within, uh, we may say that they operate within one financial system and elimination of such illegal uh, encroachments upon this financial system certainly contribute to securing smooth operation of this system. Um, what is uh, an outstanding feature of uh, money laundering is that usually, uh, quite often actually, uh, money laundering uh, is uh, conducting through the weak spots, blinds, it's conducted through the blind spots of financial system and where is it uh, where is it more easier to find a blind spot when the money is coming uh, is crossing borders so uh, we know that the um, powers of law enforcement of one country it stops at the border and the power of uh, law enforcement of another country starts to operate 
Of course, we have many mechanisms, uh, many efficient tools for cooperation of law enforcement agencies, but there certainly borders exist, borders exist and they can be misused and they are quite often misused for money laundering offences. Uh, as you know, people nowadays can easily cross borders and the efforts are continued in this area in order to secure free movement of uh, people. Similarly, goods are also uh, crossing borders uh, and in a more and more easier ways. Um, and hence uh, illegal money illegal money can cross the border of one country and appear as uh, legal uh, money as uh, lawful assets in another country uh, so uh, what are the facilitating factors of money laundering offenses we will speak about this very shortly uh, mobility of human uh, humans uh, of people goods and capital uh, technological advances we know how easy it is nowadays to transfer money from one point uh, from one national bank to a foreign bank at one click of a button uh, it's a legal diversity between the uh, diversity between legal systems especially in the criminalization of corruption and sometimes asymmetries between these legal forms therefore it's crucial that countries are uh, joining in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and other institutions which I'm going to describe to you uh, and it's important that uh, countries are um, following similar patterns in criminalization. Finally, it's the abundant operation and abundance of international criminal syndicates, which are offering their services to launder a property. Um, let us briefly uh, speak about the international instruments which are regulating anti-money laundry uh, regulation and especially criminalization. It's Merida Convention which is the main uh, convention in our um, discipline, uh, United Nations Convention Against Corruption uh, which is adopted in 2005. Its name is Merida Convention. Uh, the next one is um, Palermo Convention, which is preceding Merida Convention, United Nations, its full name is United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, adopted in year 2001. So, um, uh, the next convention is uh, uh, also at the level of the United Nations and it's actually preceding these two conventions and it's preceding uh, many other conventions and all instruments uh, which is uh, Vienna Convention and its full name is United Nations Convention Against Illicit uh, Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. Uh, at this point I want to mention uh, that the topic of money laundering, anti-money laundering, it actually originally uh, it originated in the context of a fight against uh, illicit drug trafficking, and then it further expanded into many other areas, taking the universal nature. So we have three conventions already, and I'm putting uh, by their um, informal names. So uh, the next convention is uh, at the level of the Council of Europe. It's called Strasbourg Convention and the full name is Convention on Laundering, Search, Seizure uh, and Confiscation of the Proceeds from Crime, adopted in year 1990 as early as you see it. Uh, this convention is still good and it has many, uh, many member countries. Um, I should tell that uh, this convention was um, subsequently uh, revisited 
and revised and uh, upgraded if we may call it that way it was upgraded by the warsaw convention which is entitled as council of europe convention on laundering search seizure and confiscation of the proceeds from crime and on the financing of terrorism uh, in adopted in 2005 as you can see from its very topic a new issue is uh, joined to it and not not of less importance financing of terrorism but it's not the topic of our lecture so i will uh, stop describing it right here so we have four uh, conventions so far um, and the fifth one is um, uh, at the level of the EU it's a uh, directive European Parliament and Council directive on the prevention of the use of the financial system for the purpose of money laundering and terrorist financing this is actually the sixth instrument at the EU level. So overall, we have uh, six instruments which are crucial, which are important in the uh, field of uh, anti-money laundering um, criminalization. It's Merida Convention, Palermo Convention, Vienna Convention, Strasbourg Convention, Warsaw Convention and EU Directive. Here you can see it uh, in the form of the list. I give you a couple of seconds. And uh, let us speak about uh, the uh, institutional arrangements, about institutional arrangements of internationally handling this issue. I will not go into depth, just an introduction, just an idea that uh, money laundering uh, due to the specific nature I told you that financial institutions around the world they are operating in a kind of uh, uh, one big network of international financial system therefore fight against money laundering it cannot be uh, performed only at national level it has to be done at international level and therefore uh, the international system adjusted accordingly so uh, it's composed of several elements uh, one of the elements is um, one of the participants stakeholders in this process um, is uh, international regulators international regulators in different areas of financial activities as an example I can mention to you the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which is uh, setting standards in the field of uh, operation of banks. Another one mentioned in the screen is uh, International Association for Insurance Supervisors and other, uh, other specialized Another element, another stakeholder in this process um, is the FIU Cooperation Platform, International FIU Cooperation Platform, which is entitled Egmont Group. And Egmont Group is a kind of a hub, hub which is uh, facilitating and ensuring cooperation between financial institutions, financial um, intelligence institutions and financial intelligence institutions we will be speaking about them in more details uh, under other heading of prevention but they are the primary institutions primary um, agencies which are fighting against uh, money laundering offense offenses um, Egmont group is a sort of club of this financial uh, intelligence units national financial intelligence units and once they comply with the requirements set by the Egmont group they are qualified to join its uh, network and to join its um, uh, channels of cooperation 
and the next one which I'm going to men mention to you briefly is a huge international initiative and huge international standard setting mechanism which is entitled Financial Action Task Force or shortly FATF. FATF is a mechanism for setting standards and recommendations uh, for the all the operators in this field in the field of um, uh, prevention and uh, prosecution of uh, money laundering as well as uh, dealing with the uh, assets obtained as a result of money laundering offenses uh, financial uh, action task force is operating uh, by itself and also through e uh, regional instruments regional instruments which are ensuring uh, this implementation of the standards uh, by countries and uh, among the regional forums you can see here Manival which is a specialized institution operating under the Council of Europe for the uh, countries of the members uh, of the Council of Europe and Azerbaijan is actually subject to this evaluation mechanism. Laundering uh, at in, uh, under the heading of criminalization is also very closely related with other topics which I'm not going to, to uh, talk about during this lecture but I'll just briefly mention it to you these are proliferation of um, of um, nuclear substances uh, and um, uh, terrorism financing which I already mentioned to you let us uh, switch to the money laundering offence uh, finally, after this long introduction, we'll go into the specific points. Uh, first, I will speak to you about the UNCAC requirements and specific concepts which we need to bear in mind. First of them is a predicate offence, which is any offence as a result of which proceeds have been generated that may become uh, the subject of an offence as defined in Article 23 of this Convention dedicated to money laundering. This is this definition is taken from the Convention. So uh, whichever offence is generating illegal income which further uh, is used for money laundering offence it is considered predicate offence. It could be anything it could be murder with the purpose of getting property of the deceased person, murdered person. It could be drug trafficking. It could be human trafficking. It could be corruption offences, including bribery, embezzlement. Uh, so this could be a predicate offence. The United Nations Convention, it requires that, uh, that as wide a range of crimes uh, be considered as predicate offences, in the least, uh, it requires that offences uh, covered by the UNCAC be considered as predicate offences. Um, in Azerbaijan, um, uh, according to Azerbaijan legislation, all offences which generate income or profit are considered predicate offences. It's important to uh, speak here to mention um, the issue of um, knowledge, the concept of knowledge, uh, which is mentioned that at the time of commission that property proceeds from crime. And here uh, I shall remind you the provision of uh, Article 28 of the UNCAC, according to which knowledge, intent or purpose required uh, as an element of an offence be established in accordance with this convention may be inferred from objective factual circumstances. So, what the United Nations Convention Against Corruption requires uh, is that um, countries provide for a procedural mechanism whereby knowledge is not extracted directly from a perpetrator in the form of his confession 
but it could be actually deducted it could be uh, taken from the objective uh, circumstances of a case from other factors um, another issue is uh, the proceeds of crime the concept which uh, signifies any property derived from or obtained directly or indirectly through the commission of an offense important issue here uh, which i want to draw your attention is that not only directly but indirectly it uh, shall be considered as proceeds of crime let me give you an example if um, a public official is taking bribe and then purchasing some sort of factory and or is purchasing some stocks then this stocks or factories increase in value due to some economic reasons so this would be an indirect uh, indirect uh, proceeds this additional value which is uh, accrued on the initial uh, worth of of the illegal proceeds it could be considered as proceeds it is considered as a proceeds of crime as well uh, one issue which I should have mentioned to you earlier about the predicate offences um, uh, and in addition to widest range as, as possible there also are also jurisdictional issues involved under this heading uh, which means that uh, predicate offences for money laundering offences uh, must be not only crimes we are which are committed in domestic jurisdictions but also crimes uh, committed in foreign jurisdictions shall be taken as uh, predicate offenses as well so let's say a uh, perpetrator is um, engaged in illicit drug trafficking in one country and then he's sending money to uh, another foreign jurisdiction in that case that foreign jurisdiction shall take this uh, predicate offense of illicit drug trafficking uh, as uh, as a predicate offense for the purposes of dealing with this uh, dealing i.e. investigating and prosecuting and convicting for um, uh, money laundering in its own jurisdiction in this foreign jurisdiction here one important issue which needs to be uh, stressed is that the rule of dual criminality applies here i.e. Uh, an offence committed in a foreign jurisdiction shall be considered as a predicate offence if uh, that offence in foreign jurisdiction if, if committed in uh, this in, in, in uh, the juris in uh, domestic jurisdiction if this foreign offence is committed uh, in a domestic jurisdiction if it it would be co uh, if it's considered uh, as a crime then it is it will be taken as a uh, predicate offense so as i told you uh, in a, an example if a uh, crime is take is happening in jurisdiction a and then assets from it uh, are transferred to jurisdiction b in jurisdiction B, uh, uh, the criminal case uh, will uh, be investigated uh, in uh, uh, money for money laundering offence, and it will take into account the predicate offence in uh, jurisdiction A only if uh, it is proved that shall this offence happen in uh, jurisdiction B, it would be considered a crime. So if it's recognised as a crime. In jurisdiction B then it will be uh, be subject to prosecution this money laundering offense in jurisdiction B um,
money laundering offense uh, in international instruments, uh, specifically in UNCAC, there are four types of offenses described, and they are convention, conversion or transfer of proceeds of crime, uh, concealment or disguise of proceeds of crime, uh, acquisition, possession or use of proceeds of crime, and finally, the very long title, but it actually um, describes the inquit crimes of participation in association with or conspiracy to commit uh, as well as attempts to commit or and aiding abetting and facilitating and counseling the commission of any of the uh, of the foregoing offenses i.e these three uh, uh, offenses described earlier let me uh point out that I won't be talking about this uh, fourth offence because fourth offence is um, usually it's handled in national jurisdiction the same way as all other types of crimes are handled for incurred crimes. Uh, the same uh, type of arrangement usually applies, the same type of uh, sections, articles and legal norms apply. For, the, for these offences. Whatever applies for the other uh, offences applies also for the money laundering offences. So in Azerbaijani legislation there are two sections in penal code which are mainly dealing with, um, with these uh, three offences. The main one is PC section 193 Dash one, which is entitled legalization of funds or other property, knowing that such funds or other property is proceeds of crime. Let us first deal with the conversion or transfer of proceeds of crime, number one, in uh, subsection of uh, section 193-1. It says that conversion or transfer of funds or other property uh, is about knowing that such uh, funds or other properties the proceeds of crime for the purpose of concealing or disguising the illicit origin of the funds or other property. This is actually the first element of the crime of conversion or transfer. And as you see here, I highlighted in blue color two crucial elements that the person uh, should know it's it's a mandatory requirement for all the um, all the money laundering offenses that the funds or property is generated through commission of crime and the purpose here for this specific offense has to be uh, uh, concealing or disguising the illegal um, origin so it's actually uh, if we give an example for this offense it's about the perpetrator of a crime trying to uh, to hide this illegal gains through conversion which could be anything any type of operation with the property any type of uh, transaction any type of um, movement of uh, money it's considered as a conversion or transfer the second part of this offense uh, is actually about helping any person this very it signifies the active involvement uh, um, in the uh, uh, helping any person who is involved in the commission of any crime to evade the legal consequences and here we can see uh, the consequences of what it's uh, of her action or accomplishment of financial transactions or other deals i.e. anything uh, virtually anything which uh, helps to move money or transfer it uh, to change its nature or money or property for the same purposes by using funds or other property knowing as exactly you see this uh, again this feature appears here knowing that such funds or other property is the proceeds of crime so uh, this is actually the subsection uh, the sub element which is signifying the uh, kind of uh, accomplice activity to this active accomplice activity to this uh, money laundering um, the second type uh, the second type is a kind of next step in 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 the uh, chain 
next step in the chain of this money laundering offenses of course it doesn't happen always but it happens in the case when the uh, there's a concealment or disguise of the true and then we have this long list of what is actually concealed, uh, concealed or disguised it is an it could be nature of the illegal proceeds its source or location or disposition or movement uh, or ownership of or rights uh, with respect to funds or other properties so we see this all uh, types of information all types of uh, these factors which uh, the perpetrator of this specific crime is committing so it's actually it's a, an offense of uh, mirroring uh, the first uh, offense in a sense that it's um, usually this offense is committed not by the perpetrator who committed uh, the um, predicate offense but uh, let's say typically the offender of this crime would be professional money launderers or maybe not so professional but money launderers it could be um, people working in financial institutions and the next element of it is of course naturally uh, the knowing that such funds or other properties the proceeds of crime let me tell you that uh, one uh, in, or in the procedural from procedural point of view uh, the difference between uh, this offense and the previous one in this in the standard of proof here the proof of frustrating uh, of tracing is unnecessary so it's not important that uh, the perpetrator is actively pursuing this uh, this activity of tracing of um, uh, the illegal origin of the property so as I told you uh, these people just could do this as a sort of business uh, they're not specifically trying to hide uh, the perpetrators of predicate offenses and their property they're just doing this to earn uh, their profit you could see uh, here I forgot to mention that it's in another article PC 194 and it's called acquisition possession or use of proceeds of crime so um, um, mens rea is composed of intention knowledge and purpose and actus rea is that perpetrator could be anyone including by the way public official and money modus operandi is about different transactions and operations with property and funds and other subject of this crime let us look traditionally where this is these crimes are uh, in the uh, among the different types and grades of crime and let me remind you that there are four types of crime I repeated this on several occasions in our previous lectures the four types of crime of uh, crimes of not big public danger less serious crimes serious crimes and especially serious crimes which are mostly differentiated by the number of years uh, of imprisonment uh, provided as sanction for this uh, for the perpetration of these offenses it's two seven twelve years are the boundaries uh, for these offenses and we will look at them in the order of aggravation so the typical offense uh, will be less serious crime um, it's uh, usually uh, sanctioned with the imprisonment up to seven years uh, the next one as you can see which is con committed in the premeditated conspiracy or repeatedly or by virtue of his or her official duty this I explained to you before uh, it signifies uh, that offense when offense is committed by an official whether in private or public sector as legislation of Azerbaijan doesn't differentiate between public and private sector in the criminalization of uh, certain offenses especially corruption offenses so if money laundering is committed by an official a public official it will not be prosecuted under uh, subsection 1 it will be it will be prosecuted in uh, by, uh, by um, subsection 2 
uh, even if it's a kind of a typical, uh, it repeats the pattern of a typical money laundering offense. And the next one is um, uh, also a serious crime as the uh, subsection two. Subsection three is when it is conducted by organized group or the property which is subject to money laundering, it exceeds 45,000 manats. It's uh, more than uh, 20,000 euros. So if the property is more than 20,000 euros or, or if this offense is committed by a ring of organized criminal official or criminal uh, organized crime groups, um, in that case, it will be considered serious crime, which is sanctioned with imprisonment up to 12 years. Of course, there's a difference between these two. And under subsection two, uh, the punishment is uh, less stringent. Uh, so this offense is um, classified in uh, three grades. Finally, uh, this penultimate side is that uh, I will talk to you about the peculiarities of money laundering and its different types. There are not so many. What, what is important is that um, money laundering according to the requirements of international instruments shall be established as an autonomous offense. So it shouldn't actually require the conviction for the predicate offense. This is actually a very, uh, very complicated issue, which is not uh, dealt with um, in a direct and explicit manner in uh, Azerbaijani legal system. There's certainly developments and Azerbaijani legal system is moving towards this, uh, towards this requirement. And I should tell that in the most part, it is in line with it, but there's certainly some um, uh, stumbling blocks in this area. Um, so the uh, the conviction uh, for the offence, uh, it could be foreseen. Uh, the next one is I want to talk to you about the types of the uh, money laundering. Uh, first one is called self-laundering uh, uh, of money laundering offence. It refers to the situation where a person who has committed a crime tries to hide the illicit origins of the proceeds from that crime and this is the case where the perpetrator is taking steps to hide his money um, there are also some issues in this area in uh, the uh, case law in Azerbaijan uh, there is a uh, decision of the court uh, which is actually hindering uh, this um, Type, the prosecution of these type of offenses but it's a standard it's a standard of the financial action task force and uh, it's this standard shall be complied with third party money laundering uh, it's an is a as when it, it's laundering of proceeds by a person who is not involved in the commission of the predicate offense so this is mostly relevant to the activity of uh, the professional money launderers, i.e. the people who are working in financial institutions. That brings us to the end of the lecture. And let me complete this, uh, this talk uh, by repeating our slogans. Guys, um, uh, we are uh, hopefully at the end of this difficult situation. So please continue to stay at home as uh, long as the uh, the situation requires it but during this time be optimistic and don't waste your time uh, value your time actually thank you for your attention